we looked at the question of, can you use these methods for drug development? And we also spent a fair bit of time asking the question, should we use these methods? Because there is a, a question about ethics and uh, um, just uh, you know, wisdom, uh, given the financial crisis. And I'll let you discuss that you know, with the speakers at the end, and I'll talk a bit about that as well. But let me hold off on the should for a moment and just talk about, can we do this? And so in this paper, we propose the same kind of structure as a mortgage-backed securities portfolio. We start off with some capital, and the capital is going to be backed by these various different securities that will be issued to the shareholders uh, or the lenders, and the money will be used to invest in biomedical projects. And as the cash flows come from these biomedical projects, interest and principal gets repaid to the, uh, to the uh, bondholders and ultimately the equity holders benefit from the residual. So the basic idea behind simulating a mega fund is to start off with a particular compound, whether it's a molecule or a biologic, and simulate what happens over the course of the 10-year period where it undergoes clinical trials. So maybe it goes to phase one, or maybe it's unsuccessful and has to be withdrawn or it's sold. But in the event that it is successful and goes all the way through and you get an approved drug, there's a payout. So that's the simulation that we want to conduct for a given compound. And we want to do this for a large number of compounds, let's say 150 of them, as we said in the very first day of class. And in some cases, it'll pay off at the very end. In other cases, we'll decide to sell them along the way. And in each case, we will get some kind of cash flow. And it's the cash flows we want to pay attention to. This is what we're going to finance with equity and debt. And so the question is, how do you go about doing that? Well, once you understand these cash flows, you approach the capital markets and you say, all right, what I want to do is to issue these different kinds of paper, equity, single A bonds, double A bonds, triple A bonds. And each of these pieces of paper have different risk reward profiles. They have different levels of priority. And that's going to give us capital that we get after we issue the pieces of paper. So these bond and equity holders give us a pile of cash after we issue the securities. In exchange, what we give them is collateral. The collateral is the intellectual property of all the different biomedical projects that you have under your umbrella. And over time, that portfolio of intellectual property should generate cash flows. The cash flows will then go off and pay the various different bondholders in the order of their priority. And at the end, the equity holders uh, uh, make out if all goes well. That's it. That's the simulation of a mega fund. Now, it seems simple enough, except that you need to specify various different parameters. And so in our original paper, we got parameters from the industry. We knew nothing about the underlying mechanisms of drug discovery and development. So we look at publications of what it costs to develop a drug, the historical data for revenues, uh, and we simulated a seven-state Markov chain to simulate going from phase one to phase two, phase two to phase three, and so on and so forth, and then structured a mega fund to try to capture these kinds of uh, uh, dynamics. So uh, just to give you a sense of the data that we used, we were able to collaborate with Tufts University. Uh, they have a, a data set of cancer compounds. Our original focus was on cancer for both personal and, uh, uh, and statistical reasons. Personal in the sense that um, all three co-authors were dealing with family members that had cancer, so we had a personal interest in this. Uh, and from a statistical reason, there are lots of different cancer compounds. Cancer itself is not one disease, it's many different diseases, so we thought we'd get diversification naturally. The Tufts database had 733 anti-cancer compounds in its database, and these are the statistics of those 733. So we basically looked at that data and used those statistics to calibrate our simulations. So this is our seven-state Markov chain, and probabilities of success varied across different papers. So we just pulled them out of the, uh, uh, the various different uh, uh, publications, and we ran two simulations. The first simulation was from preclinical to phase two, the early stages, and then a second simulation was phase two all the way to NDA. And we broke it up because we were told by industry experts that nobody really develops a drug from beginning to end anymore. That really the way drug development happens is the early stage is done by biotech and VCs and the later stages is done by pharma. 
So by the time you get phase 2B approval, at that point you sell it to pharma. Pharma takes it from phase 2B all the way to NDA. So we just did two different simulations, and what we found really blew us away. We found that for the early stage fund, which we scaled at about $5 billion, that the equity tranche earned a rate of return of about 8.9%. And then the debt tranches, we assumed, were paying 5% yield and 8% yield, which in our view was quite generous. That was higher than the market rates for bonds of the equivalent risk at that time. And for the later stage of phase two all the way through NDA, that was a $15 billion fund. You need more money now because you're in phase two and phase three. The $15 billion fund earned on the equity side a rate of return of 11.4%, and the bond risks were commensurate with the risks that we saw out in the industry for the appropriate ratings categories. Now, 9% and 11% may not be great returns from the point of view of venture capital, but I gotta tell you that from the perspective of a pension fund, a mutual fund, uh, you know, an investment by a retail investor, these are great returns, especially at scale. We're talking about five and $15 billion pools of capital. And so this was the first time we thought that, gee, this idea might work. But still, there's lots of different elements that we didn't understand. So our approach was to try to get many experts together to study this. And one of the, the common issues that we dealt with was, what's the right size? Is it 30 billion, 5 billion, 15 billion? The short answer to sizing it is, it depends. It depends on all of the parameters that we drew from the literature and in the industry. And in order to make this model more usable to a broader audience, we put our source code on our website with an open source license for anybody to take, modify, steal, do whatever you want with it, try it out for yourself, because we are not experts in what the parameters are, you might be. The ultimate uh, point of this is that the finance industry and the biomedical industry, they need to collaborate. And from what we saw, there was some of that, but not enough, not nearly enough to be able to get all of these parameters to be sized uh, at, to the point where we can get the funding that we think is appropriate. So one of the aspects as we said, is correlation. And I want to talk a bit about that. Our speakers are going to talk about that in more detail later on, but I want to take this head on and describe to you the concerns that all of you should have about it. And to do that, I'm going to develop a specific mathematical model of correlations. And that's going to start with success or failure. So I'm going to use an indicator variable, capital I, subscript little i, to indicate the success or failure of a single drug development project. One means success, zero means failure. Now, the basic idea behind a mega fund simulation is nothing more than just counting up the number of successes and multiplying that by your risk-adjusted NPV, right? So you add up a bunch of successes and you multiply this by this wonder number, assuming that it's all the same. You can be more sophisticated and use different projects with different kinds of cancer, different patient populations, but the, the basic calculation is just this. So what we need is the distribution of the sum of the successes, that's all. If it's independently and identically distributed, like those two green pieces of paper that I started out with, then the answer is simple. This is the distribution, it's just a binomial. You covered this in your introductory data models and decisions course. But what if the correlation is not zero? How do we capture that? How do we capture what happened in the housing market? We know from that experience that correlations need not be zero. How do we reflect that? And so the answer is there's a lot of different ways, but here's one way to do it. Suppose that we introduce a continuous unobserved variable, call it x, and let's assume that x is normally distributed. And I'm gonna introduce these unobserved variables for each drug development project. And let me just assert that there exists some level gamma sub i such that if this continuous variable exceeds it, then the project fails, and if it's below it, then the project succeeds, okay? So this continuous variable I've drawn up here, it's a normal distribution, and here's gamma i, and this probability of success, pi versus one minus pi, is just gonna be given by 
the left side of that distribution versus the right side of the distribution. I'm going to arbitrarily assume the existence of this continuous variable that tells me whether I've succeeded or failed. Now, so far I've not done anything really interesting because that's not any different from saying, OK, I've got a bunch of binary outcomes that I'm looking for. Where things get interesting is if I assume that continuous variable is itself correlated across the projects. And that's where correlation can be built in. So if I'm assuming I have a whole bunch of these indicator variable drivers, and I'm assuming that these are correlated with some covariance matrix sigma, that's how I build in correlation to my model. It's not the only way, but it's one very convenient way of doing it. And so what is sigma? What is this thing? Well, it's that covariance matrix that you know and love from standard portfolio theory. Except in this case, it has to do with drug development project outcomes, not rates of return. So typically, we have a covariance matrix of the variances along the diagonals and the covariances along the off-diagonals. It's often easier to think about correlations. And so the way you can get a correlation matrix is to pre and pulse multiply by the standard deviations. And then in the middle here is the correlation matrix. Okay. And so you all have intuition, I think, about correlations, right? It's a number between minus 1 and 1. 1 is perfect correlation. Minus 1 is perfect anti-correlation. 0 is completely unrelated. So the key here is to try to model that correlation matrix. We need to know whether or not if project A fails, does that tell you anything about the likelihood that project B will also fail? If the answer is, nope, doesn't tell me anything, then it's not correlated. Whereas if it does tell you something, if it makes you uncomfortable, if you lose sleep because of that, then that means that there's some kind of correlation. That's what needs to be modeled in this business, either explicitly or implicitly. Now, I want to go through just a couple of examples and then wrap up, because I want to have plenty of time for our speakers today. Orphan diseases is something we've already talked about. And I've mentioned in passing, but now I want to talk about this directly, that there are some tremendously attractive economic aspects of orphan diseases, one of which is that orphan diseases are very likely to be uncorrelated across different kinds of diseases. Because by definition, most of these orphan diseases are random mutations. And if they are random, then by definition, the ability to develop a therapy or not is going to be unrelated to other therapies. Now, that's not completely true. I'm going to give counterexamples to that argument in just a few minutes. But the basic idea is that the underlying science tells you that if you're tra treating Duchenne muscular dystrophy versus um, you know, leukemia of, for children, whether you succeed or fail in one should not have a lot to do with another. That's not true with therapies like angiogenesis inhibitors for cancer. If one angiogenesis inhibitor fails, that should give you pause about the other two or three angiogenesis inhibitors in your portfolio. So clearly, there are correlations among different therapeutic areas. The fact that we don't have correlation means that we have a beautiful situation from a portfolio theory perspective. Every project you include in an uncorrelated portfolio of assets will reduce the risk and ultimately increase the Sharpe ratio without bound. Without bound. Let me repeat that. If you have uncorrelated assets, you can keep throwing in projects as long as they have positive expected return. And even if they have slightly negative expected return, you might still want them for their diversification properties because if it's uncorrelated, you can drive the volatility to zero and have an infinite Sharpe ratio in the limit. So these are very attractive assets. So in some research, we actually simulated orphan disease portfolios. And what we found is that they're actually incredibly attractive, purely from an investment perspective, never mind the, the uh, patient perspective. And in order for us to make the case in a more direct and compelling way, we actually got data from a real live orphan disease portfolio, namely the portfolio that was developed at the time by the National Center for Advancing Translational Sciences, or NCATS, as it's fondly known. NCATS is part of the NIH focused on rare diseases. And they actually had 28 projects that were targeted at rare disease indications. They gave us the data, and from that data we ran simulations 
of what a mega fund of orphan disease projects would look like. And what we found in that simulation is a modified IRR of about 21%. 21% for a relatively small portfolio of about four or five hundred million dollars, 15 or 20 projects. And this shocked us. We didn't expect that. I mean, this is interesting, irrespective of the fact that it's going to do lots of people lots of good. So interestingly, when we wrote the paper and submitted it, the referees, who were not financial experts, were very skeptical. And their view was, look, these numbers, where are you getting them from? They're just sort of you know, out of thin air. You know, we want to see some kind of hard evidence. And we actually went to the trouble of getting venture capitalists to look at the portfolio that NCATS had developed. These are live projects that NCATS had. And we asked these venture capitalists to value them, give a ballpark figure of what you would pay for a project if it were for sale right now, today. And we got numbers from three or four venture capitalists and we averaged them. And that's where we did the valuation. And the referee said, you know, that, I, I don't understand that. That doesn't sound very scientific to me. And our response was, you're absolutely right. It's not scientific. But that's how business works. We went to the venture capitalists because they are the ones that are going to be paying for these projects eventually. NCATS is actually taking the projects from preclinical to the point where VCs can take over. But something happened during that time that ultimately convinced the referees. What happened is while our paper was under review, two of the projects in the NCATS portfolio were purchased by pharma. And the two projects that were purchased were uh, this uh, project by uh, SREX uh, that was purchased uh, by uh, a Baxter, and then another project that was purchased by Shire. Now, we don't know what the purchase price was for. We don't know what the milestones and other terms are. It's too complicated. But what we did was to measure the stock price reaction on the day that Shire and Baxter announced their acquisitions of these two projects from NCATS. And on the day of announcement, the stock prices went up by a combined total of about $650 million. By the way, the NCATS budget for creating the projects was about $25 million. So the proposition looks extremely attractive. So what about early stage assets where there are no cash flows? And our, our speakers will talk a bit about that later on, but before we get to them, let me give you our answer that we came up with at the time. For early stage assets that offer no cash flows, there are two things that you can do. One is you can actually issue more debt than you need and take some of that debt and use it to pay interest in the early years. Now, I know that actually sounds like fraud, but believe me, it's not. It, it sounds like a scam, but this is what's done in commercial back uh, commercial real estate back securities all the time. When you're building a shopping mall, you're not going to get cash flows until after the shopping mall is built and the renters come and start generating cash flows. But the way that commercial back mortgages work is that they will issue a little bit more money than they need in order to pay the interest early in the early years and they will disclose that to the bondholders so that they understand and the bondholders appreciate that because they need to have regular cash flows. That's part of what they're buying. And it's just a matter of changing the capital structure. It's completely legit. But the other approach is to focus on dynamic leverage, which is to say, in the early years, don't issue debt. Start with equity. And as you get cash flows, you then start leveraging up. And so in a paper that we published a couple of years ago, we actually showed you how you can go about doing that. It's not complicated. It's very straightforward. It's actually done on a regular basis in other industries. 